Hello, everyone. This is Chris Martin with another episode of Half Hour of Heterodoxy. This is a special episode. It's, we're recording this around the time of our second anniversary, and we're here with Jonathan Haidt. Uh, John and I and a few other people founded the site a couple of years ago, well, two years ago, and uh, I thought we'd chat today about what we've done well and what we've accomplished in the last two years. So welcome to the show. Thank you, Chris. So reviewing the last two years, what would you say has gone well for us? Um, what has gone well for us? Um, well, when we started this, you know, maybe we should just tell, tell people how it all started because you were, you were there at the founding. Um, when we started it, it was really just a group of professors who were concerned about faculty issues, namely that the process of social science research was having problems because I was noticing in my field in social psych that we had no real political diversity. So when people would say things, you'd expect there to be a challenge, but there was nobody there to challenge it. And the, the process of disconfirmation was, was breaking down. And so I wrote a paper uh, in Behavioral and Brain Sciences with Lee Jessam, Phil Tetlock, <clears throat> Jared Crawford, a few a couple others. And, um, uh, and so when this paper came out, it was online. I think, wait, no, no, I met you first. That's right. I met you at a, an SPSB conference, but then you That's sent right. me, but you, then you sent me your paper because you'd written a similar paper about what's going on in sociology. And one day when I had lunch with, uh, um, with Nick Rosencrantz, who'd written a paper about the problem that the legal academy is not training students well because they're never exposed to a conservative law professor. And then they have to go argue in front of, you know, half the judges were appointed by Republicans. Um, so it was those three fields, we noticed there's this problem among the faculty. And that's how it started two years ago. And at the time, this was, uh, I guess we launched it, was it September 10th? What was our launch date? And it was around September 10th. Of 2015. Yeah, yeah, we launched it to coincide with the BBS paper. And my paper, I think, had been in print for maybe two months at the time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's how it started. It was just, you know, three, three people in three different fields noticing a similar problem. And this was before any of the student protests. This was like a week before um, Missouri, the protests at Missouri, uh, two months before the protests at Yale, and then it went national after Yale. Um, so I think we've done a couple things really well. One is we were the right people in the right place at the right time. I mean, the timing was just unbelievable that we launched the site before it just became a real national issue. Um, we have been very heterodox from the beginning. Um, we've had a couple of actual conservatives, uh, which is rare. I, you know, there's very few of those around. Uh, I think most of us tend to be sort of centrist, libertarian, or sort of just left of center. Um, we had a broader range of diversity than, than just about anywhere else in the academy from the beginning. Um, we were focused on research um, originally, um, and very much now. Um, and what else have we done well? I think we've gotten across the idea, we started talking about the necessity of viewpoint diversity to get good science, to get, a, to get good process. We started talking about that, and that was before everyone talked about how we're in bubbles. That was before national events showed us just how, you know, bubbleized the academy is, some journalists are, a lot of fields are. This is a national problem. Um, so that's, I think, what we've done well. Um, oh gosh, so much. We've also, we've created all kinds of great products, the Viewpoint Diversity Experience, the Fearless Speech Index. Um, so God, we've been, we've done a lot in the last two years. Um, yeah, one of the things things that has been a, a pleasant surprise for me is the number of people who've joined the site. We expected, once we opened up membership, we definitely expected people to join, but it's hard to, to out yourself, or at least a few years ago it was right. hard to out yourself as someone concerned about these issues. There's still some, to some degree, this assumption that if you are worried about these issues, you're conservative, right. even though a, a pretty large proportion of our members, not 50%, but a pretty large number um, are liberals, and then a pretty large number are centrists. So I think mm -hmm. that's, um, that's been a good development, the fact that there's an organization where people, wherever they may be, even outside the United States, can sign up and say they're mm -hmm. concerned about these issues too. Yeah, I think, so that's right. So I think some people are afraid to join because they think that others will think that they're conservative uh, and that would be a terrible thing for people to think about about anyone um, in some departments. Um, so, and I think in part, in part that is a little bit our fault in that I think 
with our blog, we had a very open policy originally and we, you know, people submitted stuff to us and we would sometimes print it. And the people who are upset are mostly right of center and some libertarians. Um, and so we did have some pieces on our blog that were, you know, attacking universities or saying, you know, the, the, well, I mean, we think there is a problem, but I think there were some things that in terms of tone were very critical. And um, so I think that might be how some people came to think of us as a, as a right-wing organization. Um, we've always been actually pretty balanced left and right, but the people on the right tend to want to write more on the blog. Uh, but in terms of leadership, the executive committee, um, and the sorts of things we're doing, I like to think that we are people who love the university, we see a problem with process, we're analyzing what that problem is, and we're proposing solutions that will improve the process. So in terms of future plans, what do you have in mind? Um, so the landscape is changing around us uh, very quickly. And when we started this and for our first year, you know, we all thought, I thought for sure Hillary Clinton was going to win. Um, and the same pressures on universities were going to be there that were there before. And when Trump won, we had to do some rethinking because suddenly now it's like, okay, the pressures on universities are very different and we have a much angrier and more vocal right-wing media system that has been really intimidating to some professors that's like doxing and, and whipping up outrage. So, you know, when we started this, there really, I mean, the right wing was irrelevant. There it really is no right on campus. This was really a matter for the left to figure out for itself. What, you know, universities are almost everyone's on the left. What kind of philosophy, what are we going to be like? Um, but since then, the threats from the right have grown much stronger um, from Trump and, the, and his Department of Education and from right wing media. Um, at the same time, I think there's been a much greater recognition that there's a real problem in universities. Uh, we've seen that one of the most exciting, I mean, <laughs> silver linings, um, you know, one thing that happened after Trump, uh, his surprise victory, was we had a lot of people coming out in the next couple of weeks, right after the election, saying we had the Harvard students uh, wrote a letter, uh, an op-ed to Harvard Crimson, saying, Harvard, we're in a bubble. We need to be exposed to more viewpoint diversity. Give us more viewpoint diversity. We had the editors of Nature writing an op-ed saying scientists need to be, be more exposed to the diversity of ideas. Uh, we had President Obama actually a couple months before the election really saying beautiful things about the importance of being challenged, about the importance of viewpoint diversity. He, I think he used that term. Um, uh, Nick Kristof has been brilliant um, in many of his columns. So I think that we... At the same time that the dangers to universities are different now, we're seeing many more people within universities recognizing that orthodoxy is a bad thing and we have to take you know, active steps to break it up. So I think time is on our side here. I think we're, we're getting a lot more support nowadays. That's good. Yeah, and some of the nice things too are that we've got this viewpoint diversity experience now and we've got the guide to colleges, which we didn't have in mind when we started the organization. Um, well, that, that's right. Yeah, because originally we were just a blog. That's really all we were. Um, and at the time, there wasn't much awareness about these issues. So the blog served its purpose as our primary f uh, product early on. But then we started learning more about about the, the complex mechanics, about the social forces. Um, and we started seeing this is, I mean, I, you know, I think of this as the greatest social science puzzle of my lifetime. And it's, it's one that we've got to get right. Like we've got to get our universities working well. We've, and I, you know, I think the universities have to really think carefully. Do they really want to be seen as, you know, as, as being you know, not owned by, but they really want to be seen as left-wing institutions. Do they really, do they, does the left really want to own the universities? Because then you're going to lose national support, all kinds of problems are going to come about. Um, so what we're, what we're doing now is we're, we're doing a lot less critique, we're doing a lot more um, just data analysis, what's the actual data on what's happening to students, to faculty, and developing solutions. Uh, one thing that I'm learning is that most university presidents believe in free speech and viewpoint diversity, and they're in a hell of a tough place. They recognize that they're sitting on a powder keg in a dangerous time. Um, there are, a lot of them are very sympathetic um, to our concerns, and they want solutions. They, they want an open campus where people can talk but are still respectful. And so we're going to focus a lot more on helping university presidents to achieve the kinds of campuses that they want. Yeah, one thing I've observed is that there are a lot of professors, too, 
who are, are quite liberal, but also welcome perspectives from everyone in the classroom and don't even uh, reveal their ideology over the course of the semester because that's their, their philosophy is to hide that. Uh, we had a good guest blog post from Maricela Martinez uh, Cruz, who's at um, the sociology department at, at Emory. She wrote about this, how you, she actually keeps that a puzzle. So I think one of the things we could do in addition to having the viewpoint diversity experience, which is a set of content, is to get more content from professors who, whether they're liberal or conservative, who decided to really work hard at making their, their classroom open to people of various mm -hmm. ideologies. That's right. This is going to be a major push for us in the coming year, um, is to help professors do a better job teaching in a politically diverse environment and teaching political tolerance and ability to engage with each other. So for those of those viewers uh, who don't know it, our Viewpoint Diversity Experience, if you go to viewpointdiversity.org, uh, that will bring you to the landing page for the project in which it's not just like, hey, here's what different people believe. It's the whole idea of it is social psychologically, we're tribal creatures who are really, really good at, at blocking or batting away any argument from our enemies and at finding reasons why we're right. So you can't just expose students to diverse views. So the viewpoint diversity experience starts by going over well, why is viewpoint diversity important? And then the psychology of motivated reasoning and our tribal commitments and all the reasons why it's hard for us to deal with conflicting ideas. And then it walks you through how do you step out of your moral matrix. And then finally, you learn what people on the left and the right and libertarians believe. So we're developing this into an app that can be used in freshman orientation. It can be used in teaching any course. It can be self-guided. Uh, we're developing tools that will actually prepare students to talk about ideas that they otherwise might have found you know, threatening or terrible or they're unwilling to even consider. Um, and so we're, we, we want to help professors teach courses that the students will find exciting. I'm hearing from so many students now and from professors that even in seminar classes, they can't get people to talk. They can't get people to take risks. There's a lot of fear on campus now on all sides among students and among professors. And we want, we want to fix that. Yeah. One difficulty is now there's this assumption that even if you, well, there's this assumption that even if you don't show signs of malicious intent, you are malicious. So if you make a comment about yeah. race, um, it should be interpreted as, as an aggressive or microaggression or yeah. some kind of aggressive stance. And there's, um, I just talked to Scott Lilienfeld earlier today, and there's some reasons to understand that there's some reasons that people might use slights to put down African Americans or to put down gay students. But there's a wide range of statements that are ambivalent. And I, th I think one thing some social justice activists have done is, is to encourage uncharitable interpretations of what people are saying. Yeah, that's right. So there's, there's some conceptual clarifications that I think our members have been very, very helpful um, in, in clearing up. And Scott Lilienfeld has written brilliantly about the, the problems of the microaggression program. We, I think we all agree that if someone makes, if someone says something with any sort of hostile intent, which is kind of subtle or veiled, yeah, that's an act of aggression. That is something that we don't want happening. That is something that we want to teach students not to do. Um, and I think it's also important to, rec to teach students that sometimes you say a perfectly innocent thing, like, where are you from? No, where are you really from? To an Asian student. And, you know, it gets tiresome to them. They don't want to hear it over, they've heard it all the time. So you, we can teach students, you know, in general, don't, have, you know, just, that's, just be aware of the effect that this has. But that isn't an act of aggression. And where I think we've gotten ourselves into a huge amount of trouble on campus is in the name of inclusion, which is a very important goal, in the name of inclusion, we have allowed a, two things to happen. One is a shift where the intent of the speaker is not what matters. What matters is how it was received. And when you do that, now you're kind of messing with the basic moral judgment stuff. We judge people usually by their intent. But if now we're telling people, if you feel offended, then you have been attacked. There's been an act of aggression and this requires a real response. Well, that puts everybody else walking on thin ice, walking on eggshells, and that sets you up for constant conflict. More generally, 
if, as, as you've, I think you said before, something about if, if you teach people to give each other the benefit of the doubt, then they can get along with each other and you can have a good college community despite the inevitable frictions. But if you go the other way and you say, no, don't give the benefit of the doubt. In fact, we're going to teach you to find ever smaller specks in your neighbor's eyes. If you teach people to be more judgmental, that's gonna ramp up the amount of conflict. So I'm all in favor of increasing diversity of ethnic and racial diversity, sexual orientation uh, and identity diversity. But if you do that, you need to encourage people to be more generous. It's not gonna work otherwise. If you ramp up diversity and teach people to get more angry, you're guaranteeing basically eternal conflict. And this is no good for anyone, least of all members of marginalized groups. All right. Well, hopefully there'll be some more testing and evaluation of diversity programs um, as we move forward. And that should help. That's right. That would be great. That's what we need. We need. So this is something that, that we advocate relentlessly is the things we do on campus, the programs, the projects, they need to be empirically validated. And so if diversity, if, if approaches to diversity can be shown to work, we should do them. But some of the things that we do are not empirically validated and they might be doing more harm than good. And microaggression training would be one of them. Yeah, and if I like to put a plug for the Harvard Business Review, but before I do that, I just realized I misspoke earlier. The author of that blog post, uh, my classmate, her last name is Martinez Cola, not Martinez Cruz. Okay. Sorry about that. Um, Harvard, if I could make a plug for the Harvard Business Review, which my wife- Are they our sponsor? Uh-oh. They're not our sponsor, but okay. um, my wife who has an MBA subscribes to them, and I found that they've published some really good articles. There's one special issue about diversity, um, about what works and what doesn't work, and um, laying out the evidence for why these programs, why some programs seem to work and some don't, which is much better than some articles you see in the popular media where someone just writes about a program that they love, but they haven't actually tested. Yeah, no, that's right. I mean, you know, look, we're academics, we're universities. We need to be doing the research and going based on the research. And at present, we're not. A lot of what we do is based in part on political movements and political pressure. That's not the right way to run a university, I think. Right. And I think to some degree, we also have to acknowledge that we may never completely address the issue of, of some people feeling marginalized. Like as an international student, um, I think things have gotten a lot better over the last couple of decades. Um, and I think they'll continue to get better. But with the cultural diversity around the world, that's just a very challenging thing to do. I don't think we might ever have a world where no one ever feels marginalized on the basis of them coming from a foreign country. I think we can we can make things a lot better. But another problem with encouraging people to have uncharitable interpretations is maybe creating this perfectionistic attitude where people expect perfection. Yeah, and that, yeah, that doesn't, that, uh, yeah, if you keep raising expectations, you can make progress and make progress, but you don't get any benefit from it. All right. Um, so we are launching a new website pretty soon. I'm pretty excited about that. That should be launching um, with, uh, similar content to that, to the content we have now, the Viewpoint Diversity Experience and the Guide to Colleges. Do we have an estimated date for when that's going live? Uh, we expect it will be in late September or maybe early October. Okay. All right. Well, um, I think we should, this might be a good time to wrap up, but any closing thoughts? Um, closing thoughts. Um, yes. Uh, the world is going crazy around us. Um, and not necessarily the whole planet, but our country, and then there are problems in many other Western democracies. Um, we are tribal creatures. We are really, really good at doing us versus them. Um, what universities have excelled at is stripping that away uh, and creating an environment in which we have institutionalized disconfirmation, we have a sense of community, a sense of trust, and people who are very different in a lot of ways, um, demographically and intellectually, can come together. And the magic of a university is that by putting people together to disagree, dissent, argue, you get rationality, you get progress far beyond what any individual or any group could do. Um, universities are some of the crowning jewels of Western civilization. Um, and as 
polarization heats up in, in America and elsewhere, driven in part by social media and many other causes, this is putting an enormous strain on universities, on people. We're all going a little bit crazy. Um, and I think uh, as, as, um, you know, as Trump does things that make people angrier and angrier, uh, including me, um, it's harder and harder uh, for us, I think, to, to stick to our mission, um, to teach in ways that don't show our feelings or our cards or identities. It's harder to do um, uh, unbiased research. So we have, um, um, we have a very difficult uh, job in the academy, and it's getting harder. Um, I think at Heterodox Academy, we are trying to, um, trying to preserve, trying to fortify the essential quality of academic life, which is that people have to feel free to speak up, say what they believe in an environment in which no one's gonna hurt them, no one's gonna shame or humiliate them, but people will argue against them. They will give reasons against them. And so I think it's incumbent on all of us to be on the lookout for intimidation of all sorts and to try to guard this very precious thing, an environment in which people can speak freely. I'm not saying I'm not a free speech absolutist. I'm not saying people should say whatever they think um, or be able to sing whatever songs they want. Uh, you have constitutional rights to do that. You can do that off campus. But what we're trying to do on campus is create a community in which we can think together. Uh, and I think that's really our mission at Heterodox Academy. And boy, it's getting harder and harder um, as passions understandably increase. Well, I, I agree. I do think one encouraging sign is that our membership is growing. So. That's a sign that there are many professors out there who are committed to similar values. Yes, especially after, um, after violent events. What we found is that after the violence at Berkeley and Middlebury, we got big spikes in people signing up uh, because none of us want to see violence on campus. None of us think that violence and threats and intimidation are appropriate. And you know, this is the way a lot of the country is going and we don't want it to happen to the universities. Right. All right, well, thank you for your time. and. Uh, Maybe we'll do okay. another interview in six months or a year. Okay. My pleasure, Chris. Thanks for all you're doing here. Thanks. Bye.